Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. We've got a lot of new watches, some current events with a new Blancpain 50 Fathoms, a Reverso Minute Repeater, the Everest edition of the Vacheron Constantin Overseas, five Rolex watches you can't buy at any price. All of that plus live chat. In the live chat box right now, we've got Matt Foster, Blue Shirt Buddha, watching watches, your wrist chats in the show, and Butik One from Poland. I'm going to do my best with my Polish pronunciation because I know he's going to jump at me as soon as we get to Patek. Philippe. And we've got Jim M, Jason C, and John N. Soma joining in. Young XLNC from Atlantic Canada, Mr. Node Turkish Meister from Turkey, Marco, Marco B from Firenze, Rick Remaker from the American Midwest. We got Alexi Samola of Finland and many, many more. Mesnine, Mark S of Brooklyn, and Sean Hansen, Scott Wexlin, a local boy, all in the house. All right, check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. It is the best way to window shop while you quasi ignore me, and I won't mind as long as you keep me streaming. Also, check out my Instagram because I made a big change. I am now posting my full-length YouTube videos so you have a more mobile-friendly platform on which to watch those videos in high resolution. Turn your phone on its side, you can view them landscape, new long form, and still with the one minute form videos, you get both, but only on my Instagram. YouTube, you only get the long ones. Now, while we file into the chat box, I see we've got Sam Leno joining in. We've got Eric Nielsen from Asheville, North Carolina. We've got Wai Ben Wong. We've got Philip Lin. We've got Time Hill. And we've got Steve R joining in from Connecticut and Antelope 1013 from Texas. All right, guys. So while we file into the live chat and we gather for our weekly convocation, let me tell you about something crazy that happened the other day while I was in the car. So I'm listening to classic rock radio, as I often do, and I hear this announcer come on, and in bombastic fashion, he declares, 20 ribeyes for $35! 20 ribeyes for $35! That's almost $1 per steak! Now, I'm not a master of math. But I can tell you that 20 ribeyes for $35 is not almost $1, it's almost $2. The moral of the story, don't let monster truck announcers do your meat math for you. True fact. All right, now, viewers chats I asked, you answered. Armin R gets us started with his Vacheron Constantin automatic featuring the exquisite caliber 1120, JLC based, of course, outstanding. Mike T rocks his Richard Mille RM005 Felipe Massa in full Technicolor, looking good, Mike. Alan P of San Jose and his Patek Philippe 5230R visit the City of Lights. Tim Q and his Alango Unzona Odysseus visit the Jackson Pollock house on Long Island, and that is the floor bespattered by Jackson Pollock and his partner during actual sessions of creation. So all of the evidence remains. And we have Horatio A of Mexico City, wheres his platinum FP Journe Chronomet Souverain for tonight. Looking good, Horatio. Henry E impresses, going off the beaten path with his Long und Heine, Frederick III from Dresden. Guys, that's an awesome independent. If you've got a watch like that, or any watch, and a wrist, send it to me. Wrist Shots, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. That is the address to get yours on mine. See, we've got Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. Joe Pinto from Scarsdale instead of Louisville again. And then we've got Alp K joining in from Istanbul, staying up late in Turkey with me. Thank you so much, guys. Abdul is in the box, longtime friend of the channel. And we've got Henry West on board, as well as Wachusiest, who is up at this point, is it almost into the early morning in Dubai? All right, New Blanc Pain 50 Fathoms. We've been waiting for, oh, better part of a decade and a half for this to happen, it's almost at hand. Over the weekend, Blancpain, manufacturer of the 50 Fathoms dive watch since 1953, announced the winner of a women's marine photography contest. It had sponsored the Female 50 Fathoms Award. Now, Blancpain does stuff like this all the time related to ocean conservation, so in and of itself, this is not a big deal, and it's not big news. But it was no routine PR fluff this time, as Blancpain effectively soft-launched the new 50 Fathoms dive watch, and that's what it's going to look like. This is the successor to the 5015, the first wholesale redesign of the core model since 2007. The 50 Fathoms is a brand-defining product that only Rolex's sub can ride for true dive watch history. The current model, which you can see right here, is handsome, but sized for the 2000s at 45 millimeters. 
So Renee Capizzola, the winner, won serial number one of this new watch, and here demonstrates its relative proportions. You could see on her wrist, which is undoubtedly petite, this watch does not span side to side, meaning it's likely 41 to 42 millimeters, and it might be titanium. This is a great size for a rank and file 50 fathoms. The bathyscaph is 43, the 5008 reference is 40.3, but I think this reference, whatever it's called, is gonna be the sweet spot. And I should say that it's important to remember, we're going to take another look at the new watch. Some things are changing on the dial side, but I suspect the movement will be the same. So you can see the font used for the bezel is different. It's a little bit more serify, more delicate. It's a little bit narrower and sexier. You can see that the dial replaces the applique indices and quarter Arabic numerals with what appear to be radially arrayed uh, printed features. It's not entirely evident whether those are printed or lacquered or applique, it's really hard to tell. What I can tell you is what you can't really see in this photo. There's some sort of a gradient to the dial and not from the center out like a Moser Fumé. It's almost like the rolled wave dials on some Rolex watches, but with a gradient from the peaks to the troughs of the wave. It doesn't play well in this photo, but it's evident when I look at the photo on my computer. So. Probably going to be caliber 1315 here, the long-serving five-day automatic, anti-magnetic, very tough. The question is, is it going to be the same movement or will we see upgrades? Now, it's based on the 13R1 manual wind movement, which has eight days of power reserve. Both of them have three mainspring barrels. Could Blancpain find a way to add another day or two or even three of power reserve to the 50 Fathoms for the Cadillac of divers and the ultimate gas tank? I think this is an exciting watch that could become much more so if there's also a mechanical evolution on the other side. We don't know yet, but we shall see. Expect to see this new 50 Fathoms in production form this spring. Jump into the box, we've got a Mick in Florida. We've got Time Hill saying, I like the dial. Mr. Mick is saying the blue dial looks nice. Thomas Burnett saying, I'm with you, Abdul. I love the mill spec and the Barracuda, other limited editions from Blancpain in recent years. And we've got Brian B saying, Plots are easier to read. Lester loves watches, does not love this watch, saying, God, that's ugly. And we've got Abdul saying, that looks good. Couldn't wear a watch with a flapping strap. Better get a NATO then. And Dave Opencar saying, great looking prototype. Mark Kane, or I should say Mike Kane, I'm sorry, Mike, agrees that the numbers look great. Again, I'm going to suspend my judgment. I like what I see. I don't know if I love it. I will love it if it lands on my wrist, which it inevitably will, because that's what I do for a living. And I will give you my review and my hot take. Okay, more new watches for 2021, it continues. This is what happens when you no longer have big trade shows in the spring. Watches come out all year long. A new Reverso continuing the 90th anniversary celebration. Not the richest of the year, but certainly the warmest and maybe the most focused. It's not the first limited edition anniversary Reverso, but the tribute minute repeater is the most emotionally stirring. The Jump Hour Nonantium is probably more romantic, and the $1.3 million four dial quadriptyque is more complicated, but the new minute repeater is admirable for its warmth and its purity of purpose. JLC's first minute repeater, well, reverso minute repeater, I should say, in 1994 was too small to issue a satisfying sound. It's impressive they built a repeater that small, but it didn't sound great. In contrast, the 2011 Repetition Minute à Redoux was comically huge at 55 millimeters lug to lug, 35 millimeters across, so heavy it could literally build an asymmetrical bicep on its owner. And they made 75 of them, which was probably too much. Both dials on the new watch, I should say, tell time, which is intriguing and seems to be a creeping trend on high horology watches this year. This along with, of course, the other reversos, but also the kind of two tourbillon from De Batoon. I should also mention that this watch is 51 by 31 millimeters. So it's rectangular, 51 by 31, which means I can just wear it on a wrist of my size. Not a small watch, but compact for what is in it. It's 200 and 50,000 francs and viable on most male wrists, as you can see. So the 10 pieces offered should reach a fairly wide audience. It is a good looking watch. The price is high, but JLC's exclusive trebuchet strikers 
help this reversal repeater encroach on Patek and AP's claim to the tip top of the chiming watch heap. That said, it's not perfect. If we could stay full screen right here, you could see the bridges from this view as well as this one. Take a look at the interior of the bridges where they're skeletonized. It suffers the common Richemont brand shortcut of getting gun shy with interior angles. Only among the Richemont brands, really only Langa pays any attention to this detail and then not consistently. Look at those two arrows. The black one points to a sharp interior angle. On the same component, three millimeters away, you have rounded interior angles. On the same component. This is not a Richemont strong suit. I have to say that if you compare it to independence at this price range, and for $250,000 for that reverso, we are talking about high-end pricing, whereby you could consider a Grubel 4C or a Romagotier. And if you look at how Romagotier does interior angles where two bevels meet, not gun-shy about them. Heck, there are exterior angles on some of those bridges. Razor sharp and hand-finished. This is what happens when you're making 50 to 60 watches a year instead of 100,000 like JLC. All right, jumping into the box, Mr. Note 8 reacting to the new 50 Fathom saying, I could never get past to the 430 date window. Ben Z, again opining on the 50, saying more numbers on the dial than an Air King. We have J Bo Surf joining in from Adelaide, Australia, and I always appreciate you getting up early with me. Monkey C Production saying, Tim, you should have a chime off with the best minute repeaters to compare the notes. The problem is getting them all together. That's very difficult, but if you look at my videos cumulatively, you can compare a hell of a lot of them over on Watchbox Reviews. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Also right here, we got James H. saying, want a picture of that longa movement on my bedroom wall. I posted a seven minute review of that watch with that movement on Watchbox Reviews this morning. Open up a different window, keep me streaming, full size, high res, you're gonna like what you see. We've got Justin D. saying, hey Tim, want to know if you can think of any modern day alternatives to the Universal Genève Tri-Compax Triple Date Chronograph from the 60s, manual chrono with triple date and sporty. I think the best offering at the moment is actually an automatic from JLC. It's the triple calendar chronograph that came out last year. A really, really good looking watch. Now you can get a manual wind, triple calendar chronograph from Patek, but it's going to cost you because it's a perpetual calendar. What else is going on? Matteo C, Super Tim. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thomas Burnett saying the Romain Gautier is a beauty. We have A.H. Tim, what do you think of the AP 38mm Chrono Panda Dial? Do you think that would hold value? Yes. In steel in particular, yes, it would. It's a very desirable watch. There's comparatively a lot of 39mm watches out there because it was built for a long time, but we've only had about two and a half model years of the 38mm Chrono, which means there are very few on the market. Demand is high, supply is low, and that tends to both well for long-term collectability. All right, let's, uh, Eric Nielsen, Tim, I sent you a link from a relatively affordable minute repeater from our friend in Fort Lauderdale. I'm familiar with our mutual friend. I'll have to take a look at that and respond. Sorry if I've been a deadbeat there. Okay, Steve R. Hey, Tim, if you had a choice, Laurent Ferrier Regulateur or Vacheron Steel CDV. <sighs> Laurent Ferrier. I, I love what they do. I love the way they finish their movements. I love everything about the watches they produce, uh, except the Montre Ecole case. I don't love the Montre Ecole case, but still, if I had to pick a Laurent Ferrier over just about any Vacheron dress watch, I'd go with the Ferrier. It's just that much more special. Okay, you were waiting for this, the new overseas Everest editions. A big model launch, breaking just in the last four and a half hours or so. These are a follow-up to the 2019 piece unique that was worn by Corey Richards on Mount Everest. The thing auctioned off for $106,000, uh, benefiting the National Geographic Foundation. It was spectacular, with a titanium case and a tantalum bezel. Really good looking, a variant of the overseas dual time that notably received a unique case that is not simply a different set of metals and colors on the basic watch. It is a unique case, and so too are the new models. We can go back to the overseas limited editions. You can see right here, both the chronograph and the dual time have unique 
cases. Now they're different from the original piece unique in that their cases here are steel and their bezels are titanium, but they still have that lovely slate gray granular dial with the orange accents. Very, very special. They also hark back to 2009's Deep Stream watches, which combined the steel case with the titanium bezel. Those look good, these look great. These overseas models will be available in limited quantities of 150 pieces each. They will cost $31,300 for the dual time and $37,000 for the chronograph, which I believe is a premium of $4,000 over the standard dual time and $4,600 over the chronograph, which might be worth it given the scarcity and the fact that these are probably by a mile the most visually appealing versions of the third generation overseas, rivaled only by some particularly chic iterations of the basic self-winding and the rarely seen white gold ultrathin. These are super watches, highly recommended. Technically, they are everything the standard overseas chrono and dual are, so buy with confidence. These are well-proven watches and fantastic pieces. I would say if you're looking at a Nautilus for over a hundred grand and you can get on the wait list for one of these, go with one of these. Okay, jumping into the box, we have Abdul Dillon. Dylan saying, never seen an ugly VC till now. Not everyone likes these limited editions. Okay. Thomas Burnett saying, love the VC overseas. Corey Richards, the dual time function is so well executed. Benjamin B saying, I love the pops of orange and so do I. I think we need more orange on watches and more orange watches. We have J. Bo Surf saying, date kills the chrono. I would go dual time. Actually, no, I wouldn't. I'd buy a lightly used Longa at that price. Unless you're looking for a sports watch, in which case you would probably not opt for Longa. The Odysseus went from a watch that was waitlisted to a watch you could buy in dealerships to a watch no one can find in dealerships, where you have to buy the yellow gold or the rose gold dress watch to even get on the list. So you're definitely not getting the Longa sports watch, though you might be able to get into something from Chipek or Moser, Vacheron, Gerard Perigo, or Urban Jorgensen for similar money, and I highly recommend all of the above. If you can find the Laureato Infinity Edition for Vempe, you're going to be flying in that sports watch class. Okay, Alex O saying, I do like these Everest watches, but it's starting to look like the Zenith Dayfi for some reason. There were some subtle changes to the case. They became a little bit broader. Maybe that's what you're seeing right there. Okay, let's talk about viewer wrist chats. I asked you answered, starting with Toby S and his Langa Saxonia thin copper blue, proving there is more to life than the CB. This is a $26,300 watch. It's available. You can buy a pre-owned for about 22 to 25. I recommend this over any CB, guys. This watch is just better than what FP is peddling. Michael C in a spectacular Richard Langa. PC, the Perpetual Calendar, Terra Luna. The Richard Longa Perpetual Calendar, Terra Luna, is the full package. Constant Force Device, Perpetual Calendar, 14-day Power Reserve, and Celestial Functions on the reverse side. This watch has it all. Christopher H. and his Longa 1815 Automatic set with the sun during a Colorado vacation. Warren G. takes to the road with his Acura and his Grand Seiko Spring Drive Skyflake dial. Do we have Warren G. in there? There you are, Warren. Good stuff. Watching watches. I told you you were in the show today. He's also in the chat box. Hits the trails with his Nuke Proof Mega and G-Shock Cassioc. The GA2100 looking good. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay. The Arts Traveler saying, the amount of knowledge that comes out of your mouth is astounding. In addition to the other things that come out of my mouth, the, the, the knowledge is the redeeming quality. We've got Soma saying, Longa becoming a people's watch, I see. Certainly more accessible. I'd say it's an underrated watch. You get a lot of quality for the money you spend. It's not cheap. There's no cheap Longa, but you get good value, which to me is what you get for your money relative to the alternatives. And then right here we have Kevin C saying, okay, would you rather have the new Bull of a Mil-Spec Diver and Rolex Submariner or just one Blancpain 50 Fathoms? Give me the 50 blue titanium, that's my watch. No hesitation. And then right here we've got 23, a post to 23 saying, Longa is my favorite large brand. And at 5,000 watches a year, it qualifies as large, but it's not huge, and I like that. Okay, let's talk about five times Rolex almost did something really cool, but didn't. Okay, Rolex prices have reached a point where I am recommending people considering a Rolex Daytona at the aftermarket rate also consider a Vacheron Overseas Chrono for equal or less money. Yes, guys, we are now at that point. Even new 
and I'm loving that inverse panda, the price of a standard overseas chrono seems downright reasonable for what you get relative to the mass-produced Daytona. This has become an alternative, and that's insane. It's not supposed to happen. VC watches are supposed to be compared to AP and Patek, but this is happening with Patek sports watches. There's your 5980 chronograph and steel. Nuts. Okay. All of this occurs because Rolex is the definition of mainstream in the watch space. There's a lot, if you really drill down into Rolex, the history, the thousand cuts engineering approach, the fact that they have a lot of integrity about not phasing out styles and creating planned obsolescence. They protect their previous owners by not making too many watches. There's a lot to love but they are the definition of mainstream. They are the only mechanical watch brand that is a global household name and everyone knows that name. Even if they can't name a Rolex watch, they know the Rolex crown. And right now, people who otherwise have no interest in watches are scrambling to buy mass-produced products from Rolex, and that's driving up prices. So, let's talk about cool look stuff that Rolex did outside the mainstream, because mainstream Rolex has exhausted me. So let's go into the realm of the rarely discussed and check out some cool stuff Rolex stepped right up to the edge of accomplishing and then pulled back. Okay, the Oyster Quartz Daydate Perpetual Calendar. Conceived in the early 90s and prototyped in the mid to late 90s, this was the successor to the circa 1977 chronometer certified Daydate Oyster Quartz. This was a perpetual calendar, a quartz chronometer, a Daydate, all of that with a new Rolex caliber 5335 that included a Swiss lever escapement, something you will never see on a quartz watch. It was built as a lifetime watch, and only about a dozen prototypes were constructed. All of them were in stainless steel. Does that sound desirable? It does to me. But here's the thing. Rolex recoiled, and as the mechanical watch trend of the 90s gained steam, Rolex pulled back from the brink and canceled this watch. They have come to auction, and one example last year hammered for about $250,000 before the buyer's premium. So, heck, if you've got a ton of money, maybe you can buy it. But with only 10, 11, 12 of them in the world, you may never have the opportunity. But very, very cool. Really, this is the ultimate quartz watch, and it is the ultimate collectible day date in steel. Okay, a constant force escapement. Not only did Rolex think about it, Rolex prototyped it, built it, gave it a name and a reference number. Uh, this is from engineer Nicolas Dehon, who worked for Rolex before he jumped ship to pursue his idea elsewhere. Now, in 1998, Rolex pursued a patent but never finished it. And the Rolex version of the ELF movement, which is French for basically a buckling elastic spring, uh, it never worked due to the use of a metal buckling spring. But you can already recognize where this is going if you know high horology. From 2008 at Gerard Perrigo, Nicolas Dehon was able to envision and execute his idea of a buckling elastic spring using deep reactive ion etching to create a monoblock silicon oscillator that would be pushed by those little escape wheels and beyond a certain point it would snap in each direction back and forth. So the barrel never directly drove the escapement. Instead, it was the snap of the elastic spring which meant every impulse of the balance was equal. A constant force escapement drawn from a Rolex idea executed at Gerard Perigo in silicon and it was pursued all the way to a win at the GPHG in 2013 where it won the Aiguido, the best picture at the Oscars of watchmaking. Partly because the Rolex Constant Force Caliber 7230 didn't exactly work. It was a cool idea, and you can see in its layout the basic bones of the Gerard Perigo, but because it didn't really work, and it was never cased up into a watch, an example sold at auction for about $5,000 with buyer's premium, which to me seems like an incredible price for a piece of, albeit non-functional, Rolex history, a very important modern movement by any standard. Okay, jumping into the box right here, we have Benjamin B. saying, is that the source for the GP movement of the same design? You beat me to it, man. You got it. We have uh, Nefarion saying the ELF, which was something like Echappement Lame, basically elastic escapement. And then we have Craig asking, any Panerai owners? I'm sure we have quite a few in the box. You'll find common cause with them. Kevin C. saying, give me the JLC Extreme Lab to any day for crazy money. And then we have Steve R. saying, wish the Stella Dial Oyster Perpetuals didn't jack up in price. And we've got Ruben joining us early in the morning from Singapore. Thank you for waking up with me, Ruben. I really appreciate that. 
Then we have Sha L saying GP needs to put that in a Laureato. I like that idea. That's cool. If they could downsize it to something smaller than 46 millimeters, uh, that would be the ultimate combination of case and caliber. And then right here we have watching watches saying Rolex also didn't like to have the coaxial escapement. That's true. George Daniels built his coax into a bunch of different brands' watches and showed each of them the prototype when each claimed it couldn't be done. Ultimately, it was only Omega under Jean-Claude Biver that bought into the idea of industrializing it and putting it into mass production. And if you saw my interview with David Walter, uh, you would know that it was Derek Pratt who created the ultimate manufacturing solution for the innermost components of the coaxial escapement, as a result of which he was given the first production Omega coax as a thank you gift. All right, and then we've got Mr. Paradigm 1981 saying Rolex hype is good. It forces people to learn about watches and look outside of the fad and actually get something more special. That's true. It might drive you to alternatives that broaden our horizons as collectors, and this is important. So, jumping into something else Rolex toyed with but didn't do, an atomic watch. <laughs> no, not that kind. There actually is a Laco Fallout commemorative edition. I'm not talking about that watch. Not that kind. CV Raman of India. The Raman scatter effect. And it was on the basis of this effect that Rolex proposed, well, what, it's, it's hard to even say what they envisioned because it's a patent. It's not a watch. And it's almost impenetrable. But they went so far as to patent it overseas outside of Europe. This is the U.S patent record, and Rolex went through with this, applying for a patent in 2012 for a self-contained, wrist-borne atomic clock. Now, I'm not talking about a radio watch. Radio watches are common. They tune into signals from atomic clocks. This would have been an atomic clock the size of a Rolex watch on your wrist, independent, freestanding, and self-contained. Erverk and its AMC special created a giant atomic suitcase clock that acts like the Breguet Sympathique, setting, regulating, and winding an Erverk AMC watch. But the Rolex patent, which was awarded in 2014, they went through with it, envisioned something that would have been essentially the size of an Explorer II or Yachtmaster II, and it would have been accurate to seconds over centuries. We may not have seen the end of this idea, as it took 30 years of kicking about at the patent office office for Rolex to create the Sky Dweller and the Yacht Master II calibers. But I will also say this, this was perhaps the electronic successor to the aborted, aborted Oyster Quartz perpetual calendar. Is the atomic Rolex dead or is it just hibernating? Well, given a potential lifespan of centuries, we may not find out for a while. All right, then we've got Nefarion saying, good luck getting an atomic suitcase on a plane. It is true, that Erverk thing looks a lot like a very high-tech bomb. Not a real-world bomb, but like the kind of bomb that Tom Cruise would defuse in a Mission Impossible movie. It's absolutely awesome. It costs multiple millions of dollars. And critically, it doesn't just wind and set the watch. It also regulates it. So it is very, very cool. And then let's see what else is going on here. A Mick in Florida saying, Tim, you are making us hungry. So am I. I haven't eaten since breakfast. Guys, I do this on an empty stomach. That's how much I love you. And then we have Frederick D saying, why not a mechanical watch that tunes into the radio signal and radiate and regulates itself. That's basically what the Resonance Type 2 does. It connects to your phone and then regulates itself. But it is a mechanical watch that is set using your phone via an atomic clock. So something like that kind of sort of does exist. It's the Type 2 from Resonance. Wrist shots, number three. I asked, you answered, starting with Rick R. He's in the chat box, now he's on your screen. With his Grand Seiko SLGH005 White Birch, the latest high beat, looking great with attention to detail inside and out. Thanks so much for submitting that, Rick. Great dial shot. Tom B and his Tudor Black Bay 58 are in Capri, Italy, with the island of Ischia as a backdrop, looking gorgeous. We've got Dan W and his Grand Seiko Spring Drive SBGA 413 to give us our second Paris shot of the night. This one a little bit closer to the Tolifel. 
And we've got Wolfgang of Austria, a prolific supporter of the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group and this show, bringing us his Longines Legend Diver Heritage Bronze. So it is the Heritage Diver Bronze with green gradient dial. Absolutely spectacular. Well done. And we've got Mikhail B. and his Omega Speedmaster ready to hit the sky in Poland. Latest variant of the Speedmaster looking good and nicely sized for his wrist. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Or if you've got a digital watch, send me that too. I like those as well. Jumping into the box, Henry West saying, White Birch looking great. Nefarion saying, love that Eiffel Tower shot. All credit to Dan W. I hope he's watching tonight. Horatio saying hi from Montreal. Thank you for joining us from French Canada. I appreciate that. Je parle un peu de français. And then we've got Mark S. saying Brick Lane missed Tim talking about the new 50. You can rewind. This is on the channel. Rewind and watch me again if you can stand me. And then right here we say Brick Lane. Damn, Mark. Don't worry. You can watch me in replay. And then we've got Rick Goffman saying Snowflake is awesome. Could use a better adjustable bracelet, but amazing finish and accuracy. That is almost universally true of titanium and steel bracelet Grand Seiko watches. I feel the bracelets have got a little way to go before they match Rolex and Omega, whereas the dials, the movement, and the case finish is already there or beyond what the Swiss are doing. Okay. Five times Rolex almost did something cool, but didn't. You may have seen that Philips will bring to auction in early November an example of the monstrous Rolex Deep Sea Special, an extreme diver whose quirky plexiglass crystal profile inspired the modern Corum Bubble series. So you can definitely see where Severin Wunderman's bubble design came from. Conceived in 1953 and built in limited numbers, a few dozen through the mid-1960s, the Deep Sea Special was tested to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and the example at auction is likely to fetch at least $2 million. The low estimate is about 1.3. The high estimate is 2.3. I suspect the way these estimates are always rigged, those will both be too low and the real number will be higher as the watch being offered is a rare full bracelet two-tone, which is weird, but again, rare and Rolex and borderline prototype. It will bring money. The interesting thing is that in 2012, Rolex teased a modern day successor to the Deep Sea Special, the 51 mm steel and titanium Deep Sea Challenge. This is the most advanced Rolex dive watch ever made. Rolex itself drew parallels between the original watch from the 1950s and 60s and the new one. They were not being subtle about this. The lineage was clear. Rolex even placed the watch on the exterior of the James Cameron submersible in 2012 when he bottomed at the the deepest part of the ocean, the Challenger Deep. Cameron wore the deep sea sea dweller on his wrist for the dive, but the Challenge rode unshielded on the outside of the submersible right to the bottom at 35,000 feet. Now, it's important to mention, for comparison, the sapphire crystal on the deep sea, if we're comparing these two watches, is 5.5 millimeters thick. The sapphire crystal on the deep sea challenge is 14.3 millimeters thick, and the whole watch is 28.5 millimeters, all of it functional. Uh, the tank-like deep sea challenge is a chunk in profile, but again, when you're compressing this thing to potentially the force of 12, thousand meters, that's 12 kilometers, with over 13 tons, that's, that's a fistful of SUVs sitting on top of the watch. The construction of the watch is not bombastic or over the top, it's purely functional. At over two inches in diameter, it wore like this thing on your wrist, only here the idea was to keep the fish out of the watch. The Deep Sea Challenge, with a rating of almost 40,000 feet, was the most technically advanced dive watch ever made by Rolex. Again, 12 kilometers. Think about how long that is. That's like the entire Cirque de la Sarthe at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. That's like one full lap from the surface to the bottom at racing speeds, taking about 3 minutes and 29 seconds. You could fall forever before hitting bottom. It is genuinely impressive stuff. And there was hope, initially, that this exotic dive watch might hit the market in limited quantities as a proof of concept and a prestige model from Rolex. Rolex rarely launches super low volume prestige models and it would be the first diver of that kind since, well, the 1960s and the original Deep Sea Special. But it never happened. It would have given Rolex something th to throw up against extreme divers from the likes of Hublot, Richard Mille, and Blancpain. But here's the thing. 
The only lasting legacy of this watch that you can buy is the still available Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller D Blue model. If we could go back to that picture of the submersible, you could see the color of the water, the color of the submersible, all of that is preserved in the dial layout of the Deep Sea. And again, that's the only buyable vestige of this exploit. But at least five examples of the Deep Sea Challenge were made. So it wasn't a one-off. There were five available to James Cameron for his expedition. I wonder where all five are and whether or not we might be seeing one of those watches at auction in the decades to come. And I can only imagine what kind of price that Rolex diver will bring. Nefarion saying, funny thing is the Zin UX does that without being a giant hulk of metal. 5,000 meters, gotta love an oil-filled resistance. You know what? There's the Zin UX, and then there is the Bell & Ross version of that watch. You have your choices. You have an incompressible oil-filled watch that is basically indestructible if you're comfortable with quartz, because that's the thing. The dial, including the hands, bathed in oil, and that's only possible unless you're rescents using a quartz watch. Not everyone's into a quartz diver, though the UX gets it done. Rolex did it with a caliber 3135. The movement spacer for that tiny movement inside the Deep Sea Challenge was ridiculous, but still a very, very, very impressive watch in every regard. Okay, this is another occasion when Rolex almost did something really cool and didn't. The year 2000 was neither apocalyptic nor euphoric, leaving just about everyone disappointed. But if you were praying for the UFO to take you away in the end of the world, or perhaps a new leaf for a strife-fraught world, maybe you could take solace in the arrival of a landmark Rolex watch, the first ever in-house caliber Rolex Daytona. This was a big deal. Now, the automatic came out in 1988, but it used a caliber 4030 that was based on the Zenith El Primero. Heavily modified for Rolex's use, but based on the El Primero and still built by Zenith. Rolex launched its own movement, caliber 4130, in this Daytona. Now, it wasn't just an in-house auto. That was important. More important is the way it was finished. Not artisanally, but no longer the raw agricultural tractor-like appliance that you would have seen in previous Rolex sports watches. This was Rolex beginning to think about how its movements looked because they knew in the era of the internet, people would take the case back off, take a photograph, and post it on either Watch You Seek or Time Zone or whatever forums, the first version of Purists Pro, all the stuff that was embryonic in those early years of the watch internet. And Rolex was thinking about this. It seemed that display case backs on Rolex watches were imminent, and it happened for a brief moment, as in 2005, Rolex launched the Cellini Prince, the revival of a form watch originally debuted in 1928. The Cellini Prince, a collection of four dress watches with movements designed and finished to be seen, was also Rolex's first series production display case back. Each version of the caliber 7040 was designed to match the dial of its respective Rolex Cellini Prince model, so each dial matched the design of the movement. This was impressive. This was a full-throated embrace of display case backs. It seemed like the dam was about to break, and then it didn't. After 2014, the Prince went away, and no new Rolex watch, including the revamped Cellini line, the dress watches, arrived with display case backs. Rolex more or less abandoning an attempt at what seemed like it was going to be the rule in the mid-2000s. And while the rest of the industry continues on expanding the scope of display case backs, even including loops with their watches, and getting ever more intricate with fine finishing, especially among independent brands, Rolex seems to be steering farther and farther away from making the movements aesthetically pleasing. As many of the newer movements, like the 9001 in the Skydweller or the 4160 in the Yachtmaster II, are so thick and layered that there's hardly anything to be seen. Hopefully, someday, Rolex will give us an exception and go back to making display case backs and manual wind movements. Rolex, I love what you did. I would love for you to do it again. Okay, jumping into the chat box. We have uh, someone being congratulated for a fine looking watch. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the precedent comment was, but whatever the antecedent comment, if someone has a new watch, congratulations, wear it in the best of health. And then we've got Jim M saying, Rick Goffman posted pics of mine on the Tim Masso Facebook group recently. I will have to check those. I was prepping the show today, but I will go back and I will look and I will comment. And then right here we have, 
Dr. Stu saying, so at current prices, get the Zenith Daytona or Rolexes first in-house. Get the Zenith Daytona and get the Zenith Daytona in two-tone. It is the last Zenith Daytona, and for that matter, the last in-house caliber uh, Rolex Daytona that you can still get for very reasonable money. Get full box, full papers, full set, 90s, two-tone Zenith Daytona. Take the bracelet off, because a lot of people don't like two-tone. Take the bracelet off, put it on a custom strap. Now, you've preserved the bracelet to protect part of your investment, and you've warmed up and toned down the look of the two-tone. A two-tone 90s Daytona on a strap looks awesome. And you can get a Rolex Cellini pin buckle to match so you can have the full strap and pin buckle look. A stripped down 1960s look for your 1990s Zenith Daytona. And then right here we have Ahmad E saying, Rolex display case back is just too weird to think about. Kevin C saying, Tim, Rolex should do a pilot style chronograph. In fact, the first Yacht Master was a 1960s manual wind Daytona with a regatta timer dial. I would love to see a modern day revival of that idea of taking the Daytona, doing a sort of stripped down Yacht Master variant with a regatta dial, and then also a redesigned dial specifically for aviation applications, maybe including a center minutes hand. That would be very cool. Wrist shots, I asked, you answered. We've got more, and I'm glad you guys are present in the box because some of you are featured, starting with Adam. And Mr. Mood, the dog, admiring his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter at the beach in San Diego, looking good, both of you. Mark M. of Hawaii enjoys dinner by the sea with his Ulysse Norden GMT, looking good. I love these nature shots when you can fit the watch into a landscape. You guys do a great job of that. Steven and Baby Carter follow a dinner of milk with the Seiko SKX. As I say, start them young. When he graduates, then you can give him the Rolex. Michael B. and his Omega Speedmaster triple calendar, the reduced size, Fire it up in the American Midwest in Chicago. Jack Z drives us home with the Alonco Unzona 1815 and his 2021 Ferrari F8 Spider. I might be going Corvette in the next 24 hours, so I hope to join you guys on the wrist as well as on the road. I want to thank everyone who participated, including Sean off camera, the man who makes the pictures happen. He's my tech support, and he's great at that. All you guys who joined in the box, thank you so much. You make this the best day of my week and the highlight of my job. Time out, Tim out. Sean out, and thanks for logging on.